Today we will be talking about muscles of facial expression. I hope you took a moment to look at the origins of the different words that make up the muscles of facial expression. This will help you with the origin and the action of the various muscles. Right now you don't have much time but in the future, if you do have time, you should take a look at the work of Paul Ekman. He created FACS, which is Facial Actions Coding System. This gentleman can actually go into a court of law and take a look at just the movement of the muscles around the eye, very subtle muscle movement and can tell if someone is lying or not. I believe there's a TV show or there was a TV show on the same premise, but a very interesting work by this gentleman. We want to take a look at muscles of facial expression because these are nonverbal cues given by the muscles of facial expression. So think about it as a dental hygienist, if your patient is uncomfortable, more than likely it will show on his or her face. So you have to be able to take a look and have a greater understanding of what's going on. You also have to be mindful of your facial expression when you're providing patient care. Facial expression is also studied by artists and animators in order to give an accurate expression of the different emotions they're trying to portray. So as we give an overview of the muscles of facial expression, remember that the muscles of facial expression are layered on top of each other. Many move at one time to produce facial expressions. The origins are usually from bones of the face, insertions into facial tissue which allows for movement resulting in facial expression, innervation, is the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve 7. We always want to look for symmetry in facial expression. Lack of symmetry may indicate nerve damage. Remember we talked about this for an extra oral exam. We always want to take a look and look for symmetry. Let's get started on the different muscles. Orbicularis oculi, we've already learned that orbicular means circular oculi means eye, therefore this word would mean it circles the eye. So this sphincter muscle that circles the eye in orbit has two parts. Its origin is the orbital rim, nasal process of the frontal and frontal process of the maxillary bones. Insertion is the lateral region of the eye. and Some encircle the eye. Therefore, if you think about the insertion goes towards the origin, it makes sure that it would make sense that the action would be the orbital closes the eyelid forcefully. The papebral portion closes the eye gently. So basically, this muscle closes the eyelid. Both portions of this muscle, the orbital and and palpebral, excuse me, contract skin around the eye. This expression forms crow's feet from smiling. Corrugator. This muscle in the eye region is deep to the superior portion of the orbicularis oculi muscle. It runs from the bridge of the nose laterally to the eyebrows. Its action is it draws eyebrows together and downward when you're frowning or suffering. This causes vertical wrinkles in the forehead as when a person frowns. Procerus muscle runs from the bridge of the nose to medial corner of the eyebrow. When you look at the origin is the fascia covering the lower nasal bone and upper lateral nasal cartilage. To review, fascia is the connective tissue that surrounds muscles, bones, nerves, and other structures. It is responsible for maintaining structural integrity, for providing support and protection, and acts as a shock absorber. 
The nasalis muscle has two parts, a dilator and a compressor. This is if somebody is able to and to wiggle their nostrils, dilate and compress, move the nostrils in and out. I know I can do this or I do this when I'm laughing. Epicranius muscle is a two-bellied muscle connected with an aponeurosis, which is a fibrous sheet which covers the superior most part of the scalp. Its action is to elevate the eyebrows, move scalp forward and backward. The anterior belly contracted with surprise. If you put your hand on the frontal bone on your forehead and bring your eyebrows up like, oh my gosh, can you feel the muscle? If you put your hand on top of your scalp and do that same action, you should be able to feel a little bit of movement on your scalp. An aponeurosis, again, is a fibrous sheet. If you were to open your palm of your hand, stretch it out, the palm of your hand, that is also an aponeurosis. Here is just a review on the orbicularis oculi, corrugator, and procerus muscles. Okay, so when we're talking about the epicranius muscle, the two bellies, the frontalis muscle is from the, covers the frontal bone, what do you think the, the posterior belly would be called? Think about where it is. If you have occipitalis, you're absolutely correct. Okay, let's talk about the orbicularis oris. Orbicularis again means circular, oris means mouth. This is the sphincter muscle 
of the mouth. This is the kissing muscle. When you look at the name of this muscle, quadratus, would it make sense that it would be four muscles? Labi, lip, superioris, upper. These are muscles that attach to the upper lip. The first three together produce scorn. Zygomaticus, smiling. If we look at the levator labi superioris, the origin is the maxilla. The insertion is the upper lip. The action is it raises the upper lip. The expression would be scorn. Levator labi superioris Alike nasi is origin is the maxilla. Insertion is the ala of the nose and upper lip. Look at the, think of the words. Action is it raises the upper lip in dilating nostrils. This is also for scorn. Remember I said that these first three muscles are for scorn. Zygomaticus minor, origin is the zygomatic bone. Insertion upper lip. It raises the upper lip. Again, the expression is scorn. Let's talk about the zygomaticus major. We already mentioned minor. That helps to form the expression of scorn. The pig has nothing to do with anything other than the expression that the zygomaticus major allows for is smiling. The origin for the zygomaticus major is the zygomatic bone. The insertion is the angle of the mouth, more specifically the orbicularis oris. It elevates the corner of the mouth. Levator anguli oris, think about the words. This lies beneath the levator labii labi, excuse me, superioris. Its origin is the canine fossa located in the maxilla. Its insertion is the orbicularis oris, which is at the angle of the mouth. This levator, it brings up, it elevates the angle of the mouth. This expression is for smiling and laughing. The action of the former muscle produces the facial appearance perceived as smiling. It pulls the upper, pulls the lip corner obliquely up and back and deepens the furrow running from the nostril to the lip corner. The orbicularis oculi muscle lifts the cheeks upward and draws the skin toward the eyes from the temple and the cheeks. It narrows the eye opening and may cause crow's feet wrinkles to appear at the outer corner of the eye. Remember the orbicularis oculi, crow's feet. So you can't have a true smile without contraction of the zygomatic major as well as the orbital part of the orbicularis oculi. A true smile, look in the mirror. It also affects the muscles around the eye. Resorius is the small muscle which runs forward on the surface of the buccinator. If you look at the origin and insertion, it would make sense that the action would pull the angle of the mouth laterally. This is, the expression is smiling widely, grinning. So, you know, now think about depressor labi inferioris. This would depress the angles of the mouth. This is a superficial muscle. Its origin is in the mandible. Insertion is the lower lip.
Depressor anguli oris partially overlaps the depressor labi inferioris. This muscle is also known as the triangularis. Look at the shape of the muscle. This depresses the angle of the mouth. The expression is frowning, as in grief, sadness. When you have a patient in your chair and you're trying to, to work on the lower anterior teeth and, you're, and you try to move the, the lower lip away, oftentimes there may be somebody who fights you with the lip and it makes it very difficult to access the vestibule there. So what you have to do is really try to manipulate, have the patient relax and really manipulate that muscle. Not sure who that man is, but he definitely has the look of disdain. Let's do a review of the muscles of facial expression, those muscles around the mouth. Hopefully this will clarify what we're talking about. Let's talk about the buccinator muscle now. This is a very important muscle. It plays an important role in mastication. It is not a muscle of mastication, it's a muscle of facial expression. But this muscle helps to keep the food on the occlusal plane, on the occlusal table. The duct, Stenson's duct of the parotid gland pierces the buccinator muscle. If you take a look at the origins, the pterygo, pterygo mandibular raphi and the alveolar process of the maxillary and, min, and mandible, maxilla and mandible, and the insertion is the orbicularis oris. I'm just going to show you the next slide. 
This is the Terrago mandibular raphe. This is going to be an important landmark when we're providing local anesthesia. More specifically, when you're giving an inferior alveolar injection. The buccinator muscle, again, makes up the musculature of the cheek. Action, it pulls the angle of the mouth lateral and posterior, compresses the cheek, keeps food on the clusal surfaces, and the parotid duct, Stenson's duct, passes through this muscle. It pierces it. Muscles which form the core of the, la of the laughter of exhilaration would be the zygomatic major and the bicularis oculi. Muscles also used to enhance the laughing activity are the following, levator labi superioris, risorius, mentalis, depressor anguli oris, orbicularis oris, and the activity of the buccinator and depressor labi inferioris muscles is also luck likely. Auricularis. These are not well developed in man. Can anyone wiggle their ears? Platysma is a broad, thin, superficial muscle of the neck. So if you take a look at the origin and the insertion. The action is it raises the skin of the neck. Expression, dejection, horror, grimacing. Remember this is a broad thin muscle located in subcutaneous, subcutaneous tissue of the neck. Realize this is a lot to, to think about, but we also need to think about the cervical muscles the SCM, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, we've palpated that for the extra oral exam, and the trapezius muscle. These are innervated, these cervical muscles are innervated by the accessory nerve, cranial nerve 11. Remember that the muscles of facial expression are innervated by cranial nerve number 7, the facial nerve. So here's your SCM. Contraction on both sides flexes the head forward. Again, it's important to palpate the anterior border for enlarged lymph nodes. Trapezius muscle elevates and or rotates the scap scapular, the clavicle. This moves the head backward and laterally. It allows shrugging of shoulders and holds the head erect. Okay, we're going to talk about the muscles of the soft palate and pharynx. During swallowing, movement of the soft palate separates the nasopharynx from the oropharynx, preventing food from entering the nasal cavity. So the muscles of the soft palate and the pharynx are also involved in speaking. The nasopharynx is the region above the soft palate and connects the posterior nasal cavity. Oropharynx is between the back wall of the throat soft palate and opening of the larynx. So when you have a patient open their mouth and look in, the oropharynx is at the back wall of the throat. Laryngopharynx is the opening to the larynx and the esophagus. The muscles of the soft palate move the soft palate up and back to contract against the posterior wall of the throat. The throat muscles bring the throat forward. This separates the nasopharynx and oral cavity during swallowing, prevents food from entering the nasal cavity. It eliminates the nasal sound from speech. So if you take a look at the, 
the names of these muscles, you can understand a lot about the action. The pharyngeal plexus is innervated by the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerves, but the muscles of the soft palate I'm sorry, I, I let me go back to the innervation, the pharyngeal plexus, except for the tensor belly palatini muscle, which is supplied by the trigeminal nerve. So the plexus, as I mentioned already, is innervated by the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves. If you go to the learning guide on page 46, you may want to color these muscles. Palatoglossus, when you think of glossus, always think of the tongue. This forms the anterior tonsillar pillar. It's the vertical fold anterior to the palatine tonsil. Its origin is from the median palatine raphe, which is a midline fibrous band of the palate. This pulls the tongue up and back and the soft palate down. Palatopharyngeus, it forms the posterior tonsillar pillar, which is the vertical fold anterior to the palatine tonsils. It narrows the fossies to help close off the narrow the nasopharynx during swallowing. Levator villi palatini is situated superior to the soft palate. Its insertion is into the median palatine raphe, which is, and its action is it pulls the soft palate up and back to bring it in. It contracts with the posterior pharyngeal wall to close off the nasopharynx. The tensor villi palatini stiffens the soft palate. It helps open auditory eustachian tubes to allow air to flow between pharynx and middle ear. This is to helps to equalize air pressure. This is the muscular fibers which underlie the uvula. Its action is it shortens and broadens the uvula, which changes contour of the posterior and soft palate, which allows the palate to adapt to the posterior pharyngeal wall to close off the nasopharynx during swallowing. The muscles of the pharynx, these are three paired muscles which elevate and dilate the pharynx so it is ready to receive the food that is to be swallowed. The pharyngeal constrictor muscles include superior pharyngeal constrictor, middle pharyngeal constrictor, and inferior pharyngeal constrictor, which are to follow. It's a lot to remember here. Constrictor pharyngeus superior connects with the buccinator. Remember the buccinator forms the cheek at the pterygo mandibular raphe. Its action is to raise the pharynx and larynx and helps it drive food down into the esophagus. Constrictor pharyngeus medius origin is both horns of the hyoid bone insertion posterior median, median raphe. This raises the pharynx and the larynx and again helps to drive food down into the esophagus. Constrictor pharyngeus inferior origin the oblique line of the thyroid cartilage insertion posterior median raphe of the pharynx and its action is to the raise the pharynx and the larynx. 
We've talked about in the past, but you may want to look on page 25 of your learning guide for, for a good explanation of the stages of swallowing. Here are your muscles of facial expression. Again, you can find this in your learning guide. Remember we talked about the aponeurosis, the ap epicranium has the two bellies, the frontalis and the occipitalis. Platysma, large muscle on the neck. Sternocleidomastoid, this is a very powerful muscle. It has, it attaches to four bones. Remember, the mastoid process is on the temporal bone. Bell's palsy is a unilateral facial paralysis with no known cause. Some studies say it may be viral. It's a loss of excitability of the involved facial nerve. All or some of the branches of the facial nerve are affected. The onset is abrupt. The patient may undergo remission or this may become chronic. See the drooping. Okay, let's review. What is muscle A? If you said three, you'd be correct. How about function of B? This wrinkles the skin of the forehead. Remember, frontalis muscle for surprise. Muscles A and B in their joining aponeurosis form the, if you said two, epicranium, you'd be correct. Muscle number C is, if you said four, you'd be correct. Be careful because remember orbicularis is circular and oris had to do with the mouth, so it's number four. D is also called, remember it's the orbicularis oris muscle, and it's the kissing or whistling muscle. Muscle E is, if you answered platysma, you'd correct. All the muscles labeled in this diagram are innervated by the, these are all muscles of facial expression, therefore they are innervated by the facial nerve, cranial nerve number seven. So if you answer three, you are correct. Okay, you may want to take a look at this diagram and see if you can figure out which muscle is which. Remember, muscles one and two are not very well developed in man. Not many people can wiggle their ears.